All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, very excited to be talking to an individual who competes for Game Bread Bare Knuckle MMA, and that all goes down on November the 10th. We've got an individual who's testing skills against Christopher Wingate, and very happy to be talking to Mike Sanford. How's everything going, man? You having a good, solid weight cut and everything? Yeah, everything's going good so far, man. Got a few more pounds to go, and then, uh, then I'm ready. Yeah, and it seems like you're preparing with some very top-notch individuals leading into this one. It seems like you've had a long-running, you know, training history with Alan Belcher, and he's obviously prominently featured on this card, and you've got your own fight. Like, how's this, I guess, camp been leading into this particular card? I would think that it would be a good one. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been really interesting, man. Um, so I've been, uh, I've been doing martial arts for a long time. I've been coaching for a long time at a pretty high level. Um, so all the guys that I'm on the card with, you know, Alan, uh, Brandon, Jason Knight, Chase, Tyler, like all these guys I'm fighting alongside this time, I've coached them for over a decade, you know, so it's, uh, it's the first time I get to fight on the card with them. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I was going to say, because it's like, you're talking about being there for a lot of different instances in their own competitive career like how much does the dynamic shift now that you're also in the competitor role and you're kind of in that camaraderie with them on this particular event well i guess uh, as far as like fight night goes we're gonna find out you know it's my first time uh ever competing um on a major card and cornering and coaching on the same night so uh uh, it's gonna be fun, you know. Hopefully, uh, I don't get too busted up, and uh, I can I can still we can hear my voice and stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, but it's it's something I haven't done before, um, so I'm really interested to see how it goes, and I'm excited for it. You know, it's a really cool opportunity. So it's definitely uh, picked up my personal training and you know my excitement level is high because uh, you know I've never done anything like this before. It's a new challenge, uh, but it's kind of fun, you know. Uh, but. As far as what to expect goes, you know, I've, uh, this is my first time doing this, so I, I, it's going to be a little bit different having already fought and then having to, to, to help coach guys and get in the back and go in the corner. It's uh, something I haven't done before, so I'm excited to, to try it, you know. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like there's a lot of moving parts and everything like that, and I was seeing that you have previous, you know, gloved MMA experience. What is it about, like, a bare-knuckle version of mixed martial arts that's really drawing you in like what kind of captured your attention with this oh a lot um so i guess my big thing i've never really uh, as uh, for myself personally i've never really enjoyed competing you know it wasn't something that i sought after um i competed my whole life in combat sports I, i'm a lifetime martial artist but i mostly i really only competed because my coaches told me to do it to get better and you know they were right competing does make you learn quicker it does um you know, we're getting that emotional engagement and uh, it, it makes you get better quicker, for sure. Uh, and I tell my students that now, too. But I guess as I got older and became the coach, um, I started not having that push motivation anymore. And then I had some injuries, you know, and I just I, I just took down the coaching. I just kind of stopped competing. Um, so I, I, when I saw Bare Knuckle, though, it kind of uh, kind of reminded me of, of the early – days of MMA when I saw people, it wasn't just competition, it was like a real fight. And it was, uh, um, you know, not having that equipment in the way. That's the other thing too, like when, I, when, I, when we do fight, even with just little gloves and those, uh, you know, things like that, it, they get in the way, they change the way you do things. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not as fun for me. Like if I'm going to get out there and, you know, fight, I, I would rather have the least amount of equipment possible, you know? I've always felt that gloves should be optional. You know, if guys want to wear gloves, like for strikers, they help. You know, it makes sense. If you want to be able to hit something harder, you know, one of my favorite things to tell people is, you know, they, they, they talk about the gloves being, you know, uh, less dangerous or whatever. They're not. They're mallets. I mean, go go punch a, uh, a tree, all right? Go outside and punch a tree with your bare fist and see how hard you're going to hit that tree, you know, and how careful you're going to be. Now, go put a glove on and punch the same tree. It's totally different. You're going to hit way harder. You're going to be way less careful. You know, it's, it's just, uh, it makes you... It lets people get away with less technical violence um, and and not pay for it. So for me, I've always been drawn to the the idea of no gloves because you have to be more technical um, and you get a benefit from being more technical um, on, on a very high level. So the no gloves thing drew me in a lot for that reason, for, for grappling and striking, you know? Um, so I'm all about it. I think people should be allowed to wear gloves if they want. 
but I don't think they should be required to. Well, from what I can tell in, you know, doing my research on you, it seems like your, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills are at a very refined level and have been there for a decent bit. And also what I've seen from the empirical evidence surrounding bare-knuckle MMA, more often than not, the submissions do manifest and you do have those results. Like there's that demonstrable proof to back that up. So I would think that your style would really lend itself well to bare-knuckle MMA. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the gloves and people... You know, the gloves only help the strikers. That's that's a fact. Now, some strikers are going to be just as good without gloves if they're properly prepared and they trained correctly for it. Um, but the more, especially the more precise and skilled strikers, you know. But uh, the gloves do not help grapplers in any facet. Like, there's no benefit for a grappler wearing gloves. <laughs> so they only they only uh, have a detrimental effect on grapplers' skill sets. So me being primarily a grappler, uh, being able to to use my full arsenal without having to adjust it for having these big gloves on. And, you know, even though they're four ounces, they're still big, you know, they're bulky. It's not like I'm wearing latex gloves. You know, they, they change the way that you have to do things. Um, and not having to make those changes is very exciting to me. And is there a certain sense? I mean, obviously this is a new and exciting endeavor competitively, but does it almost bring you back to the formative kind of years? Cause it seems like getting into like early UFC and those like Hoist Gracie tapes like really set you off on a you know profound journey. Absolutely, yeah, and that, that is another, and that's kind of what I was saying. Like you know, one of the reasons I started fighting again this year, um, I saw that bare knuckle card. Well, like, I, I cornered you know Jason Knight's one of my guys, and uh, he fought on the early bare knuckle card against uh, uh, Charles Bennett, and uh, I've had a few guys fight bare knuckle boxing. Um, so I, you know, I kind of saw this coming back a little bit and I'm like, man, I can't wait till they do some bare knuckle today. And people started to tell, you know, all my students want to see me compete. So I guess that's kind of my push motivation these days. Now that I'm the head coach, um, you know, my students are the ones that they wanted to see me fight. They never got to see me, you know, cause I haven't competed since 2011 until this year. So my students that started with me even 10 years ago, never saw me compete. Um, so I can understand them wanting to see their coach get out there and fight. Um, and, uh, so that gave me a little bit of push motivation. And then whenever the bare knuckle boxing started gaining steam, getting popular, I started thinking and, I, and saying that if bare knuckle MMA came around, I'd probably get out there and fight again. And then sure enough, the game red card came out. And not only was it bare knuckle MMA, but it, they did it, such a phenomenal job with the show. I was an instant fan of game red bare knuckle. Like they did such a great job with their production. Uh, Dean Cool was a phenomenal promoter, and Jorge Masvidal obviously he brings a ton to the table. So I just I, I'm really stoked on this organization to be honest you know i love the way that they're doing things i can see where it's going and um, i'm just, i'm super excited to be a part of it honestly i guess i'm wondering like based on how you're talking about this i feel like it's a curious question to pause it like are you looking at this in terms of like maybe like a longer term like multiple bout sort of endeavor or is it like a matter of competing and then kind of seeing where things go from here in a certain sense like you talk about really being motivated to compete for your students so they can get to see that like do you have a certain idea for what the arc through this bare knuckle mma endeavor could look like perhaps that's a great question man honestly it's kind of uh i'm, st I'm still uh forming in my mind you know what, what i have planned so my my original idea i was just going to do one one fight and then uh you know uh just call it. I'm, I'm 38 years old, so and I've got a, a, a business. I own two big gyms that are very busy, and uh, you know they, they require a lot of work. Um, I have a full staff of coaches. I have a, a lot of high level fighters. I have a lot of up and coming fighters. I have a lot of people that just train self defense that are just as reliant on me as the fighters are. I have a kids program, and honestly, I put just as much time in with the kids. I teach all age groups. I work with you know the little kids, the big kids. The highly competitive kids, the kids that are getting bullied in school, the adults that want to learn how to defend themselves, you know, uh, I mean, and, and then, of course, the, the athletes and the competitors. So, I mean, I have a lot on my plate um, as far as my job goes already. Uh, so, adding in fighting and training, I thought that it might be too much, um, but I feel like now, you know, I did those couple fights and I was thinking about, you know, maybe doing one more and stopping with, you know, if this... If this goes well, I think I have a good balance now where I can train and compete a little bit. Even though, you know, I'm 38, so I don't have a whole lot of years left if I do decide to compete. But uh, I think depending on, you know, how things start to go, um, I might I might put a, put a few more fights in, you know, and see how it goes. Um, I definitely, you know, I've never had 
uh, a really, uh, I've never had a war, you know, all my fights were, I was able to finish pretty quickly, you know, even back in the day. And, uh, we had a lot of good guys get it to bare knuckle MMA. And, uh, I would love to have one of those real tough fights, you know, uh, at some point, maybe, maybe I'll get it Friday night. We'll see. Yeah, I guess I partly ask, too, because it strikes me as a very intriguing sort of thing. Because, I mean, you mentioned guys that you've imparted techniques to over the years and just how high level they've been in both MMA and bare-knuckle combat, as well as specifically bare-knuckle MMA itself. So the idea of you being able to, you know, have imparted techniques to those people, but also to glean certain things from, like, their previous experiences in it, it just seems like a very intriguing fight coming up here like it seems like you're gonna have a lot to really showcase in a lot of regards oh yeah yeah that's uh, that's my game plan i plan to uh um you know i, I my thing is like I, don't, I might not have a whole lot of professional fights but another thing is i have been fighting for 20 years you know my first fight was in 2003 so i have a lot of experience um so my my hope is um what i what i'd like to do on friday night and what i plan to do and what i what i'm confident i can do is win impressively i, I want to win impressively and i want to kind of jump ahead and fight somebody more experienced next you know if uh if, if all goes according to plan so I, I believe that I can compete with guys that have 20 fights, you know, guys that have you know been in the UFC um, and things like that. So if everything goes according to plan Friday night, that's what I'd like to do next. Um, I, I would like a fight with a, you know, a higher level opponent um, in a bare knuckle MMA fight next. And, and the other thing too, bare knuckle MMA it doesn't count on your regular MMA record. So all these guys are starting fresh too, <laughs> even if they fought in the UFC and all that. Yeah, and I guess pivoting to your opponent here because he did have a previous bare knuckle MMA fight, albeit a fairly succinct one. So not a lot to maybe glean from on like a tape study sort of level. I mean, I guess presuming you're a guy who does engage in a bit of tape study with your opponents, if that is the case, and you've seen some of his previous, you know, forays in boxing and everything like that, as well as mixed martial arts, like what would you say some of his better skills are and everything like that, like better stylistic attributes? Well, he's definitely uh, his best skill set. Definitely is boxing, um, and he does have. He had, you know, I think, but we did some bare knuckle boxing. Um, so he has a, a, a more bare knuckle experience than I do for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, he's got a uh, you know enough uh, of a ground game to to uh, be competitive in professional mixed martial arts. Um, but I believe that there's going to be a, a big skill gap. Um, so I, I, I'm going to, I'm looking to go out there and fight. I want to, I want to get all aspect. I haven't gotten hit yet, you know, so I want to, I want to have a fight. So, uh, I, I believe he's going to bring it. Um, I think he's going to swing for the fences. I think he knows his best chance to win this fight is to knock me out. So I think he's going to go for it. I think he's going to go wild and I'm ready for it, you know. So, uh, I, my plan is to, um, you know, avoid his strength, obviously. Uh, I want to avoid just getting in the pocket and trading with him in a brawl. Um, I know he's got some good explosive flying knees. He's going to look to swing out, you know, and try to surprise me with. Um, so, you know, I think those are going to be easy opportunities to put him on the ground if he does do that. Uh, but I, I, overall, I think his, his boxing skill set is for sure his best thing. And what he's going to look to utilize the most if he fights me smart. Um, he also might panic. You know, he's in my hometown. There's going to be a lot of people yelling, and uh, I believe there's a high probability he'll panic and go for a Hail Mary and, you know, end up on his back falling, you know? I mean, he goes for a lot of flying kicks and weird flying knees. Um, so if he does that, it makes my life a little bit easier. Uh, but if he sticks to his game plan and tries to box me with his fundamentals, um, he, you know, he's got skills there. You know, he's fought professionally in boxing. He's fought some good guys, you know? Um, so he's got, got a good amount of experience he brings to the table there. So that's that would be you know my toughest matchup with him is if he goes out there and fights with his uh, boxing fundamentals and tries to turn it into a boxing match. Uh, my job is to not let that happen. You know I don't want it to be a boxing match. It's a mixed martial arts fight. <laughs> it's just interesting because I was going to like refer to how you were describing it as like oh yeah go to your bread and butter. But from what I was also seeing in researching you, a lot of like striking based martial arts kind of like laid that foundation for your martial arts journey too so it seems like you'd be comfortable wherever it goes but maybe relative to this opponent you see that lane in the grappling being like the defined one i guess yeah well a lot of people i mean actually you know so my first martial art ever was boxing i i grew up um my grandfather was a boxer he's the guy that taught me how to punch you know i'm kind of dedicating this fight to him a little bit 
Um, yeah, it's gone, it's gone Veterans Day. He was a Marine. It's the Marine's birthday. Uh, he passed away uh, recently. So, you know, this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's a big fight for me for that reason too. Um, but I am comfortable, you know, in striking. It's just not, it's not my best strength. You know, it's not where I can compete uh, with the highest level guys, in my opinion. So I, I believe that getting into the ground is my easiest path to victory. But also, not only that, um, I'm not in a rush to get it to the ground. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand and trade with this guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do things smart. You know, I've, I've definitely um, been doing this long enough to know not to make those mistakes. Um, and uh, I uh, plan to get him on the ground and use my jiu-jitsu and show the jiu-jitsu. A lot, a lot of people think about grappling. They think it gets boring once it hits the ground, you know. And my jiu-jitsu ain't boring. You know, I, it's not going to be boring. I, I make sure that um, I. I believe the ground game can be just as entertaining as the as the standing game and uh you know we see Khabib do it Khabib finishes people on the ground left and right he is fun to watch when he's on the ground right nobody complains when Khabib gets a takedown okay because he's constantly looking to finish people he's constantly punishing and looking to finish and that's the way like I think my whole team fights you know everyone on my team we have the same mentality we're going to punish you we're going to be aggressive we're going to be relentless and we're going to try to finish you and I think that's why people like watching us fight so much you know um, sometimes it can cost you a split decision. You know, we got a couple guys on our team that have a lot of split decision losses that are questionable um, because they maybe didn't uh, play it as safe as they should have, like, you know, in hindsight. But, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, the way I see it is, uh, you know, this is not about being safe. You know, if you want to be safe, we have self-defense classes about being safe. This is, you know, about it's about fighting, it's about winning. You know, winning is very important. But you want to win and be excited. This is entertainment. You know, I'm out there not only to win a fight and to be safe, but I'm also out there to entertain people, you know? And I believe you can do all those things if you train properly. Yeah, so you favor submission over position, to put it simplistically. Uh, well, I see submissions as... I got a unique perspective. I see submissions as positions. Um, oh, okay. I, I think position is very important. I do agree with that statement, but I believe every submission is a position, and I control them. But I, I, I like to use so my favorite positions. A lot of people, if they talk about, I, I don't do you train uh, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at all. I was gonna say a bit. I'm like a one stripe white belt, so I'm not particularly good. But yeah. <laughs> all right. So you have an idea of uh, the positional hierarchy that's common in Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. All right. So mine's a little bit different. Um, I don't really believe in sweeps and the guard and all this stuff. Like I don't use those. I, I do use those terms because when people come in and sign up for Jiu Jitsu, that's what they want to hear. Um, you know, from a business perspective, I would just drive everyone away if I didn't use those terms. But for my advanced students and my competitors, I don't use those terms. I don't believe in them. I believe in top position, okay, and I believe in uh, rides. I'm big on rides, wrestling terminology. Um, and uh, I believe in finishing positions, you know. So, well, those are submissions, right? So the positions I mainly look for, instead of, you know, trying to get side control, I don't even, I don't even like side control. I like to get on top. And then my positional improvements from being on top are to collect the legs, collect the arms, or take the back. Those are my finishing positions. So if I get the back, I have rear naked chokes and all that stuff. If I get the legs, I have all my leg locks, and I have the legs entangled in position like 411, or uh, the honey hole, they call it, inside Sankaku, and all these different types of ashi now that are getting popular. If I have the legs, I have finishing positions there, and we'll depend the hip and control with dominance. And then the arms, you know, I look for the, the Eddie Bravo calls the spider web. And I look to, with those positions, not just get a hold and entangle something, but like control it dominantly and pin the person with it. Um, and those are the positions that I hunt. So some people might see that as submission over position, but I don't see it that way. Those are my positions. I control those positions and I can stay there all day and just try to finish people. And that's what I'm looking to do. I was going to say, I love that depth of detail because, yeah, it almost is a limiting mindset to just look at submissions as like a complete risk and a totally vulnerable sort of state. It's cool that you look at it in a more sophisticated positional sort of way. That's cool that you articulated it like that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people think of like, so the armbar position that I like, Eddie Bravo uses it in his overtime. So you watch EBI, they do an overtime. And in overtime, he lets people start on the back or on the arms, which is the spider web. I think you should add the legs in too. I think they should be able to choose all three, but they do the arms and the back. Um, and those are finished positions. Well, those are the positions that people should be the most focused on. Now, mount is great. I love mount also. Mount's a phenomenal position, especially with striking. Um, it's a great ride. Um, but there's other positions that are just as good as mount from the top. You know, I like cross body rides just as much as I like mount. 
And I haven't finished just as many people from those. I have, you know, my guys finishing people at high level with that all the time. But in jujitsu, some of those rides that I prefer to mount even are considered the guard and they're not worth anything, you know? So, um, I, I believe those rides are really powerful for controlling people. And then my main focus is getting those finishing positions, but even those. So if I skip mount, because to me, for me trying to finish my opponent, that arm bar position where I get the arms is superior to mount. So I'd rather skip that and get there as long as I can control it. And, but in jiu that won't give me any points. I'll lose a jiu-jitsu match if I don't finish the arm bar, even though I had a better position that was closer to the finish. Uh, but in MMA, it's going to win me the match because the judges are going to see, oh, even even an idiot judge recognizes an arm bar if I'm holding the guy down with it, right? Um, so uh, I think uh, it goes a longer way in MMA. Now, the uh, I guess the idea behind my positional hierarchy here is, is that some people, they think about mount as the position, and the arm bar is just a, a, a submission you do from there, right? And if you jump to the arm bar too quick, you just gave up mount and you lose or whatever. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you should be just as good at controlling the arm bar position as you are controlling mount. So I put, I, I put just as much time into that. I don't do the arm bar just to get a quick finish. I do the arm bar to control my opponent for as long as I can. You know, um, and I think that's that's uh, a little bit of a difference in the way that I approach things compared to some people. No, it's just so interesting and. I mean, this isn't really a question so much, but I liked that Alex Vamos video, like the prank video you did. Where, yeah, because I'd seen that video kind of going around over the years. I didn't know that was necessarily you guys. I don't think I knew the specific people in the video, but a funny video all the same. Yeah, I mean, that that was fun, that whole experience. It must have been. Oh, yeah, it was a blast. Uh, you know, it was an idea I had for a long time. I always wanted to do that. Um, I kind of had that script in my head a little bit. Uh, and, you know, the right opportunity didn't really pop up. Um, because most of the guys that are high enough level to do that and pull it off, uh, they're pretty well known. And people, you know, when I have them come in, they're coming in for a seminar, and everyone knows that they're coming. Their picture was on the wall. They looked them up already, and you know, it would never work. And if somebody in the class would know before it happened. But with Alex, he wasn't really well. He wasn't really competing a lot. He wasn't very well known. He's my friend from New York, but he's he's a really you know he's a really good black belt, pretty high level guy. And uh, you know, he happened to come down to help Alan with a fight. He was uh, coming in to train with Alan a little bit uh, unannounced, so I didn't have a seminar poster up for him or anything like that. And uh, when he got there, I talked to him like, "Hey, man, I had this idea for a prank. I've wanted to do this for a long time. Uh, you think you can? You, you think you want to do this with me?" And he said, "Yeah, hell yeah." He wasn't. He, he like he does like uh, improv acting and stuff like that. So that's why he was so good. He's a, he was the perfect guy for that. Um, so he was all about it. And we last minute just put that together that day when he arrived uh, down in Mississippi to train with Allen. And uh, it was awesome. By the, by the end of the class, a couple guys had looked him up because he had his, he had his school's gear on. <laughs> so, and they were coming up to me like, hey, I think this guy's sandbagging us, you know? Look, he's got a picture on a website. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was funny. I wish some of that got in the video and it didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I saw like a caption in a reference video too where you were talking about how you tried to replicate the prank, but like you're trying to do it in Brazil and like half the bar you were in like knew who you guys were, so that was funny. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was hilarious. Yeah, we went down <laughs> to Brazil in 2016. So that's three years after this video came out. I thought it was enough time. Um, so I, we were going to go to a school. Um, you know, my, my, uh, my instructors are in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, they know everybody, you know, he's, he's, he's really well known down there. So we were going to go visit a school that, you know, uh, wasn't really connected to us and just visit as Americans, you know, and we were going to have Alex wear a blue belt and go in there and roll with all the guys and like, make them think, oh, this is the level of the blue belt in America, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> like these, you know, these younger brown belts that haven't been there yet. Um, so that was the idea for the prank. But like the first night we got there, we went to a bar in Rio and like six people at the bar recognized Alex in the video. A couple recognized me, you know? So like, all right, there's no way it's going to work in an actual school. (laughs) No, that's fun, man. I love all of that. And I mean, I really appreciate you making the time to talk, especially in such close proximity to the fight. But in saying that, I want to be mindful of the fact that you're still cutting weight and everything like that so in bringing that up i'm curious if maybe you have any final parting thought you'd like to add as we're sort of wrapping things up here man no man uh, I'm, I'm excited you know I, obviously i got a few pounds to lose right now so i'm about to get sweating um but uh just make sure you guys come in and watch uh, it's gonna be free on youtube which is pretty awesome so if you're not in mississippi and you can't get tickets free on youtube watch this stream uh, I'm going to be the first fight, you know, so and I'm, I'm planning to start it off with a bang. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if my guy is coming ready, it's going to be a fight, you know, so, um, 
I'm, I'm excited for that. And then, uh, man, it's going to be a phenomenal car. I'm, as a fan, even if I wasn't on this, I'd be excited for this card. There are some bangers on here. I mean, Jason Knight versus Randy Costa, that is going to be a war. You know, Brandon Davis versus Joe Penafield, that's going to be a really fun fight to watch. You know, Penafield, always, he's always uh, throwing out that wild stuff. He's always fun to watch. And Brandon Davis is a technician, one of the most technical guys I've ever worked with. Um, and uh, he is a savage, too. You know, if you watch him throw down, he does not go backwards. He, his fights are always exciting. Um, so both of those guys are super exciting. And then we got uh, Chase Sherman. Uh, he's fighting... Um, uh, the guy, I can't pronounce his name. I'm going to butcher it. Um, but they're both really good. It's going to be an awesome heavyweight war, I'm sure. Um, we're going to see a knockout in that one. I think it's going to be amazing. Uh, I mean, just overall, phenomenal card. There's not like one bad fight. There's probably a Lombard on there. Like, I mean, I, I can't believe how good of a card this is, to be honest. I'm just, uh, you know, overwhelmed with gratitude that I'm able to be on this. Well, it definitely comes across, and I mean, Definitely echo the sentiments about this card, a very stacked event, and I'm very excited for your fight. There's a lot of intrigue to it for sure, and I think it'll be a great way to kick off the card, and definitely going to be hunkering down and checking out some game-bred bare-knuckle MMA on November 10th, no doubt. But until then, you have a good rest of your day. Best of luck with the remainder of the weight cut, Mike, and just thanks for the time, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much.